This is the Competitive Edge with Jerry Colonna. Welcome to the Competitive Edge. My name is Scott Britton and I'm here to help you answer a question that we all have. How can I get an edge in my business and life? Each week we're going to uncover how some of the most successful and inspiring entrepreneurs, entertainers, and thought leaders get an edge so you too can reach your full potential. Thanks for tuning in today. Now let's get started. What's up, Competitive Edge listeners? Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Today, I'm excited to bring you one of my personal inspirations, Jerry Colonna. I still remember the day when I first found out about Jerry. I was talking to my friend, Matt Champagne at WeWork Labs in New York City and asking him about people that maybe I should consider as advisors for my first company, Sifter, which totally bombed, by the way. I remember him bringing up Jerry Colonna and I had never heard of Jerry, but it didn't take me long to find his blog and start to develop a total man crush. What first stuck out to me about Jerry was his unique career path. He went from being a wildly successful venture capitalist to life coach. I hadn't seen many other high powered investors in the startup world seek a career change into something that was unrelated to $100 million exits. And I remember thinking that it signaled to me radical self-honesty. This is a trait of Jerry that I've really come to admire, and you'll certainly get a taste of in this interview. I've been super lucky to get to know Jerry over the past two years and consider him to be one of the most thoughtful, honest, and insightful guys I know. Today, Jerry is going to provide some amazing advice on how we can manage the emotional roller coaster that comes with being an entrepreneur. I definitely left with a few things to chew on, and more importantly, some empowering mindsets that I think anyone listening to this episode will find helpful in their personal journeys. And when I mean helpful, not only help you be more successful, but also more happy and enjoy the journey. Sit tight. This is definitely one of my personal favorites. Let's hear from Jerry Colonna. Jerry, what's up, man? How are you doing? I'm great. I'm doing awesome. Uh, So today I want to talk about a topic that has been on my mind ever since I got into this whole entrepreneurship game. Because as you know, man, it is an emotional roller coaster. And most recently, I was listening to your interview with John Fields. I brushed up on the Jason one that I absolutely love. And so many things are just incredibly present to me when I listen to these. The feeling of constantly having to be doing something, the entrepreneurial FOMO that we often get, just the challenges of being present and attentive. And I guess we can really start off just by talking a little bit about the role that emotional fitness plays in the entrepreneurial journey. Okay. So in your experience, I mean, you've worked with a ton of successful entrepreneurs, been a successful venture capitalist. I mean, where, where does emotional fitness come into play? How important is that? Well, I think what occurs to me, and I can't help but be a coach, so I'm going to turn the tables. What does it feel like, Scott, when you as an entrepreneur are not operating in an emotionally fit place? And then there is the, within that response will be your answer. So I guess we can start by talking, I'll talk about the specific emotions that I often feel. And then when I feel those emotions, what happens? Yep. So specifically, I mean, a big one for me is just this feeling of of being lost, um, of waiting in uncertainty. And when I have uncertainty, a lot of times what happens is I'm I'm less productive. Uh, I'm less enjoying the process. And, you know, I want to curl up into a ball in my bed and not do anything. And, you know, that's completely counter to the inspired state that I operate at the highest levels at. Right. Right. I I, I love the the fact that you went right to this notion of uncertainty. Um, You know, I do a talk around the notion of failure called crash and burn. And, uh, in the talk, I make the point that we fear failure for a host of reasons, which creates a kind of uh, 
energy that energizes that roller coaster, right? We're afraid of failure. But a corollary to that is a deep and profound sense of uh, fear of uncertainty. It's as if there's a voice in our head that says, and I just wrote about this in a blog post, that the path is supposed to be straight, unrelenting, and up and to the right. And that any time we experience the feeling of lost, confusion, that we're backtracking, uh, that somehow it's evidence of our unique failure, our unique screwed upness. Is that an accurate reality? Is that? Of, of course not. I mean, just, just look, at, look, at, look at any trailblazing that occurs. Let's play, with, let's play with the path metaphor for a moment. Anybody who is walking a path that someone else has walked generally experiences less uncertainty. You walk in the woods and you follow the path and you don't even actually have to think. But anybody who has actually blazed a trail in a, in a forest knows that you take a step and you pause and you look around and you decide where you're going to make the next step. And then all of a sudden you're on your path and you encounter a boulder that you can't go around. So you actually have to double back and you have to carve a new path. And that is the process of trailblazing. Entrepreneurs are trailblazers. So, you know, this is an interesting thing for me because it seems like the way that you just laid that out is very obvious uh, in, in a simple metaphor like that. But for some reason, we still experience and endure these emotions. Yeah. So what you're identifying right now is the difference between what our logical adult mind feels or, or, or observes and what our heart feels, right? Or what the amygdala feels, if you want to be technical about it, right? What the, what the, what the prefrontal cortex, post-evolutionary brain feels and what the pre-evolutionary brain feels. And the pre-evolutionary brain feels fear. Everything's a threat. Everything is either a threat or a potential threat. And so then we encounter uncertainty, and it must be threatening. We encounter a feeling of lost and not being sure what path to go on. But every wisdom tradition I've ever encountered says the same thing. When you're lost, you stand still. When you're lost, you take your bearings. I mean, I learned this as a Boy Scout, learning, you know, navigating the woods. But it's the fear that causes us to go crashing forward. You know, Go ahead. yeah, you know, you, you also, you posed a question in one of your most recent blog posts that made me realize that maybe it's a part of it too, of just minimizing this fear minim and then thus the, the downfalls of what comes when you're living like this and trying to pursue your mission like this is what if being lost is part of it? What if we entered in the journey with that expectation instead of being blindsided by it and then curling right. up in a ball like I, like I said that I do sometimes. Right. What if we, when we decided to be an entrepreneur, we, did, we didn't merely fall prey to the propaganda that says everything's up and to the right. We're going to end up in this place of wealth and happiness and sex and love and it's all going to be great it's going to be great fucking great man it's fucking great what if we said it's going to be hard and i'm going to be confused and i'm not sure it's the right path for me and i'm going to be challenged and if i can bear that regardless of the financial success that may or may not come from me i will be a better person for that there's a formula that comes to mind right now that Tony Robbins uh, taught me that I really like. And basically it's it calls it the happiness equation and it's LC equals BP. Happiness is when your life conditions equal your life blueprints. 
when there is an imbalance of that is when you're unhappy. So perhaps, you know, what you just described, if we can align our blueprint and expectations of what we think is going to happen, I mean, we're going to be much happier in the journey, which is, you know, what the hell this is all about, right? Like it's all those, the sex, the love, the money, the fame, the power. I mean, screw it. It's all about the journey, right? So like perhaps we should be best preparing ourselves for the journey instead of worrying about all these other things that are, we hope to eventually get to, but who knows if we'll ever even get to them. Yeah. I mean, his health is reminds me of what his holiness, the Dalai Lama wrote in the art of being the art of happiness. What he basically advises is that the art of being happy is a question of accepting things as they are. Right. And one of the first teachings I do in my boot camps is this being so, so what, which is a Zen saying, which is this is your reality. Now, what are you going to do about it? Instead of getting yourself up into a frenzy because the reality is not mapping against your expectations, to use Tony's expression, right? The reality is the reality. Now, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to respond to that? And the, the degree to which you can enhance your capacity to deal with that, with a reality for an entrepreneur that changes every single moment. We're up, we're down, we're up, we're down, we're up, we're down. The degree to which you can enhance your ability to handle that is going to determine, to use your earlier term, your emotional fitness. So how can we cultivate that muscle? Well, first and foremost was a thing that you, you identified early on, which is what's your blueprint? What's your, what are your expectations? Are you starting this process? Let's presume for a moment we're speaking to new entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. If you're starting this process, what's what? It, and be radically honest with yourself. Are you starting with this process, presuming that you're going to fail, or presuming that you're going to succeed? And this is counterintuitive because a lot of advisors will tell you you want to be positive. Okay, and you yourself write like that. Mm-hmm. I'm not suggesting to be negative or pessimistic. I'm suggesting to live in a very interesting gap place. The gap between recognizing that 99.9% of startups fail and you're going to do it anyway. 99.9% fail and you're going to do it anyway. And don't, I'm speaking to them directly now, do not give in to the temptation to say that you are a unicorn and you are an exception. Because when you are not, you will feel like crap. Right. If you can launch a business saying to yourself, it probably will fail, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to have an adventure and it's going to be one heck of a ride that no business school on the planet can give me, then now you're ready to be an entrepreneur. You know what, man? I bet you that mindset too allows you to just pursue things with such such a greater sense of boldness, right? Because you're not worrying about screwing up. You're like, hey, it doesn't matter. It's probably going to screw up. And you're not worried about ultimately what is, what is the currency that you worry about, that you guard so much, how people think of you, what people think of you, how people feel about me. Am I lovable? Am I a good person? Am I going to be cast out of society as this like awful human being because I had this humiliating failure? I mean, I give voice to it with an extreme thing because it's kind of silly. But that's what's really at the root of that. Yeah. But if you can do that anyway, then you get to enjoy the insanity. Let's talk about some other ways to enjoy, to enjoy the insanity. And, I, and I, love, I love this idea of just setting the expectation in the beginning. I think one thing that I certainly go through and I feel like we're doing a live coaching session here and I'm, and I'm getting, I'm getting lucky. This is a, a freebie for me, I guess, but oh, no, I'm sending you a bill. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I think one thing we all feel is like this, this, uh, fear that we're not doing enough and fear that we should always be doing working or achieving some sense of progress. And I mean, I know I sure as hell feel it. 
And when I'm not doing anything that's not moving me forward, I feel like I'm wasting my time. And I think this is weighs incredibly on our emotions, thus our abilities to be successful. And I just want to know, like, I guess, A, what can we do to mitigate that in the beginning? And then we, when we find ourselves in those states, have you noticed any practices to help us get out of them? Well, first and foremost, you know, I often, my particular equation, by the way, is practical skills development plus radical self-inquiry plus peer support equals enhanced leadership and greater resiliency. Okay, so practical skills, radical self-inquiry, peer support. So using radical self-inquiry, you ask yourself when you're having that feeling or when you're even thinking about and recalling that feeling, you ask yourself, what's the true fear? What am I really feeling? When I feel, when you feel, Scott, that you're not doing enough, give more expression to it. What, what is it that you really feel about yourself? If I don't do more, then I'll fail. You, if you don't do more, then you'll fail. Okay. Um, I also, yeah. Um, I think about perhaps if, if I don't do more and then I fail, I'll be able to look back at this and be like, I didn't do enough. And it's my own fault. I didn't do enough. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. Just as I am. Right. If I don't do enough, if I don't do. So the doing is actually an expression of a lack of confidence and care for the being. Right. And so what we confuse is that if I run around faster, if I do more, then somehow that feeling inside of me that I'm not good enough will go away. And we'll use exogenous material expression of self to cover a hole inside of ourselves. Now, step one is to understand that there's a correlation that the less good we feel about ourselves inside, the more likely we're going to be to run around like a chicken without a head. Okay? So when you find yourself running around with it like a chicken without a head, A, you're probably driving your colleagues fucking insane. My roommates can probably attest. (laughs) B, you're probably actually not making market success. You may be doing a lot of things, but you may not be making market success. So if that's the case... Then you got to sit down and you got to pause and you got to go, okay, what am I trying to, I'm trying to use this work as an expression of taking care of me inside of here. What if who I am is valuable regardless of whether or not I succeed? It's almost like we retreat towards doing more work instead of addressing this problem. Yes. Yes, because doing more work and even this, encountering the fears associated, the anxiety associated with not doing enough, is actually more palatable than, than dealing with the underlying question, which is, oh, fuck, I actually don't really like myself. And who the hell has time for therapy? I don't want to go into that. I don't want to ask those questions. Hmm. Because I'm just like, I, I got to get stuff done. I'm too busy. Yeah. That's a harsh reality to face. Yeah. And let me tell you, we in society use a lot of stuff to not face harsh reality. Do you think that a lot of entrepreneurs are maybe the ones that have the chip on their shoulder or fuel or really just, I mean, I'm thinking thinking to a lot of people that I know I'm thinking of myself at times, like we have something to prove because we're not necessarily in love with ourselves. I think that the lack of self-esteem is an epidemic problem in our society. Um, And I think that uh, entrepreneurs are particularly susceptible to the problem partially because uh, the entrepreneurial mindset, especially in the United States, is so celebrated. And then, therefore, 
you know, the shadow side of that is a kind of vilification, demonization. Um, I think that uh, it's particularly vulnerable because the process of starting a business, as I've often said, it's a kind of path, it requires a kind of pathological optimism. And the pathology there is not just this sort of weddedness to optimism. It's a kind of weddedness to the belief that uh, I will, uh, that this thing is an expression of me. How many people do you know use the phrase, you know, this is my baby? Mm. I mean, a lot. a lot, a lot. And the fact is, no, it's not. No, it's not. Your babies are your babies. <laughs> right. This is your company. This is your idea. It's not a baby. So it's not your flesh and blood. So is, I mean, is divorcing our identity from our work part of the recipe for having an enhanced emotional fitness as an entrepreneur? It's a little more subtle than that. It's divorcing your sense of self-worth from the achievement of the outcome. So we're, in a sense, I understand. I am a coach. It is part and parcel of who I am. Or more specifically, I am a coach because of who I am. So identity and meaning are very much tied together. But how I feel about myself isn't dependent upon whether or not you like me as a coach. How I feel is not dependent upon whether or not I'm successful as a coach. Or let's put it this way. That's the practice that I have to work through every single day. So I want to ask you because theoretically, like, yeah, that sounds great, but we're in the trenches and somebody tells us that we suck at what we do or what we're failing. I mean, it's not as easy to be like, well, Hey, uh, you know, I, I don't tie that oh, too let's much. Oh, let's yeah. get some green tea. And yeah. I mean, yes. dude, honestly, like when I hear that, when somebody tells me that I suck as a podcast host or my blog sucks or an, a product I create isn't good. I mean, that, that still hurts. This one. Who the hell are you to give advice about happiness or any of this stuff? Who are you? It's not like you haven't struggled, right? <laughs> Amen, like brother. I just, I just hit the big, big red button on your chest, right? Who are you? So, yeah, how do you deal with that? What I try to teach, what I try to do is take time throughout the day to reconnect with true purpose, true purpose, not ego-driven purpose, right? Why do you do this thing that you do, Scott? If we're is talking, it a thing? Yeah. If we're talking about podcasting or like yeah. this show right now? This show. So honestly, man, it makes me feel, it makes me feel alive. Okay. That's a consequence. I, I can understand that. So there's a piece of you, I imagine, that enjoys the ego uplift of it. A hundred percent. Great. I love how you just embraced that and didn't deny it. Beautiful. Okay. How about, who do you envision listens to this? The same person that was myself and is myself, right? Yes. On the way to work every day, as I was trying to pick my ass up out of bed go to my job, which I, I love my job, but like the person that was on the subway craving growth, craving inspiration. And dude, that was a big reason why I wanted to create this because, I, and I'm not just saying this to be a cheese ball. Like you're not cheese ball. So dude. many, so many of my days and mornings, the most exciting part was like turning on that podcast. I'm okay. listening to two people have a conversation that inspired me. What did it? So it inspired you. Mm -hmm. It inspired you to feel something other than what you had been feeling in the moment before it. What were you feeling in the moment before it? Uninspired? I think I was feeling. So the specific emotion and inspiration would evolve from a creative spark that came from a new insight of the conversation. Okay. And so what were you feeling before that? Not alive? Probably bored. Bored. Tell me about boredom. So up, get on the subway, another 
25 minute ride down to the financial district. Uh, yeah. you know, another, an, another day in the routine, another right. day in the grind. I just, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. You just use those words. Cause the metaphor that was in my head was you remember ever seeing like a, you know, a blind horse tied to the wheel forced to work, walk around that circle. Yeah. My, time, time, my, my right. parents loved taking me to the, uh, the blind horse circuses growing up. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I don't, so now this is like weird my, mystical woo woo stuff. Cause the blind horse popped into my head. So it's clearly a metaphor for you. It's a powerful, powerful metaphor for you. Right? Yeah, no, Tethered, forced, boredom, hell. It's hell, isn't it? To be t- tethered like that in that grind. Dude, that is... Holy crap. I think that's the uh, reason that I wanted to become an entrepreneur is that I never wanted to be bored because I feel like I'd be wasting my life, right? And so what? It's hell. Okay. So there's an ego gratifying part of you doing these podcasts. And then there's a deeper purpose here. You want to release some people from hell. I'd like to think so. And that's purpose. Mm. That's powerful. So how can we get, how can we answer this question of purpose as entrepreneurs that will help us, you know, divorce, divorce what we're doing from our, our egos? Uh, your, 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 your core question around emotional fitness leads us to this place of how do I separate myself? Right. How do I, how do I, how do I, inculcate that sense of worthiness independent of the thing that I'm doing. And that led in the conversation to me suggesting that reconnecting to purpose, true purpose, deep purpose, is actually the antidote to feeling so tied, you're having your self-worth so tied. And and here's a little bit of Buddhism for you. I, I apologize for slipping it in like this. Bring it on, man. Okay. Another aspect to the art of happiness is putting other people first. When you reconnect to those blind horses, when you reconnect from the kid who was bored, who was looking at a potential lifetime of boredom, and you said, not for me, And when you put together a podcast for that person, you're actually thinking of other people. And when you do that, you put a little bit of air between your sense of self-worth and the achievement of the goal. Because if nothing else, Scott, be satisfied with the notion that you tried. Yeah. That's good. That's really good. So if we can codify that for everybody out there who maybe is, has a different mission, right? Has a mission that isn't about freeing people from the shackles of boredom, of monotony at a high level. How would you describe that? Focus on other people. Focus on other people. Okay. The mind in its grasping nature is always going to find its way reverting back to, but what about me? What about me? What's in it for me? And that's where our problems begin. The answer to what's in it for me is what's in it for you. Is there a way, because now I'm thinking a lot about the entire motivation for people, that, that people might even be setting themselves up for emotional failure as entrepreneurs because they're starting without the realization of this in mind. And they're thinking to themselves, dude, they're thinking of the money, sex, power, all that stuff. Or or proving their parents wrong or proving their parents right or proving the voice in their head wrong or proving the voice in their head right. Yes. Yes. 
Finish so, your thought. I interrupted you. No, 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 no. I, I, I mean, so, you know, the, the thing that you just described is like, um, some of my friends, we, we always just joke around like, yeah, I don't actually want to be a Navy SEAL, but I just want to see if I can do it. Like, I want right. to see if I have what it takes. Right. And Why? yeah, yeah, because I guess we don't think we're good enough um, as is. Right. And I guess my question is, is like, what specific questions can we ask ourselves and what do we have to, what do we have to prepare ourselves mentally when we ask those questions? Cause a lot of times we like to bullshit ourselves. What is the, what is the questions and mindset that we need to take so that we don't set ourselves up for failure? All right. So a couple of questions. What am I really up to? Radical self inquiry. What am I really up to? You said something just now and I wanted to respond quickly to it. You said a lot of times we are, we, we bullshit ourselves. I would argue that all the time we want to bullshit ourselves all the time. Okay. So be skeptical of any thoughts that come out of the myth making machine between your ears. Okay. The mind is always playing tricks on you because it's always trying to, to reinforce this notion of, you know, separateness and I'm at, okay. So, What's really true? This being so, so what? What's really true? What's true about the world? What do I really believe? What am I up to? What am I up to? What's my agenda? What feeling do I want you to have about me? And if you want to be uh, less negative about it, you can say things like, what need am I trying to meet? What need is Scott trying to meet? Can you give an example need that somebody might be trying to meet? The need to be loved. So the next time you're sitting down with a salesperson and they're driving you insane because all they're telling you is all the calls that they made, but they're not telling you what they closed. What need are they trying to meet? They're trying to throw away this feeling that they're unworthy. They want you to walk away going, boy, this is a hardworking person. Why? Because probably the truth is they're not meeting their numbers. Because if they were meeting their numbers, they'd lead with that. Right? Yeah. Rather than yelling at them or getting sucked into it, you just put a pause and say, what's going on with you? What's going on? Yeah. I hear about the calls you're making, but I don't hear about the numbers, the deals you're closing. You having problems? And, and by the way, this is not like necessarily therapy, pretend to be a therapist. This can be strong and holding people accountable but it's about you know cr really getting in touch and cutting through the that delusionary mindset what are the best ways for people to start to develop greater self-inquiry self-awareness radicalism because even i mean you know you and i both know man like i i feel like i'm actually a pretty self-aware guy um, but I, I always could be much better. And I think a lot of people out there are probably, you know, maybe self-awareness is a new thing for them. It is. I think cultivating friends will tell you the truth. It's really powerful. Like cutting a deal with a friend that says, Hey, listen, dude, the next time you see me doing that thing that I do, you know, that thing I do where I dance and I bullshit. Could you call me on it? Even if it's just a signal chocolate. You're doing it again, chocolate. Mm. Call me on it. Because I don't always see it myself. You yeah. know, it's little things like that. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a, building an organization, do you hire people who are going to yes you to death and feed your demon? Right? Feed the ego? Or are you hiring people who, with a little care, with non-aggression, but assertiveness, say, hey, you know what? I'm going to call bullshit on this one. The product actually doesn't work and our business strategy doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I guess, you you know, instead of protecting ourselves, it's actually seeking out people that are going to fortify ourselves from not being self-aware. That's right. It's, it's, it's really about opening yourself up to being vulnerable or opening yourself up and being vulnerable. Because there's a risk there. You said it yourself, right? You know, uh, we, we try to protect ourselves. 
from the truth, from reality. It's because it's harsh, it's painful. I've heard you allude a couple times to the practice of taking a pause. Yeah. Which as any, it is so counter to the culture that is honestly often celebrated in entrepreneurship. And I'm, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that, a little bit about any other rituals that can help just manage all of these emotions, keep us in check uh, to make sure we're not, you know, getting too down of a down too deep of a rat hole we can't climb out of. All right. Well, remember, speed kills. Okay, speed kills. Um, I love Brad Feld and David Cohen, but I hate the title of their first book: "Do More Faster." Um, the problem is. And I understand the impulse. I'm not suggesting do nothing. And I'm not suggesting don't work hard. Problem is that we get into this state of faster, 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 faster. And we use the motion to push away reality, to push away sensing reality. Right? So, you know, I often say things like, did you go to the bathroom? Did you take a glass of water? Did you go for a walk around the building? Did you, you know, it doesn't have to be a big con- contemplative, you know, sit on the meditation cushion kind of thing. It, I mean, it's great if you do, but it doesn't have to be. It could be something as simplistic as having a ritual of having your meetings and five minutes earlier than you normally would and pausing. Yeah. You know? I mean, uh, I think that certain ritualized techniques, um, you know, in, in our society, one of the gifts of their spiritual practice isn't so much a closeness to God, because the truth is, I don't know if there is a God or many gods. I really don't know. But I like the notion of pausing kind of once a week and Using that as a day. I mean, I don't care. Go surf. Every Sunday morning, I'm going to go surf. And I'm going to worship the divine by actually listening to the surf before I get in. And I want to hear those waves. I want to smell them before I see them. I think a big part of that in making that a consistent thing is recognizing the value in the pause. Because I know for a long time, myself, I avoided reflection in every way. I avoided looking at like whether somebody responded to an email that I sent out that I was a little nervous about. I re- re- avoided analytics. I avoided certain conversations. I avoided all of these things that that just like forced me to potentially change what I was doing. Is that why you avoided them? Because you didn't want to change? Well, I didn't want to face the reality. I didn't want to face the truth that would require, that would signal to me what, that I was. Yeah. What was the potential truth? That something I did sucked or that I wouldn't feel good. I, that the, the potential truth was that I did something that was not optimal and that I would feel bad about myself. So not only were you afraid of actually you. You were afraid. You didn't just have the notion of discomfort about a particular set of feelings. You were afraid to even come close to potentially having those feelings, which most people are. Right. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why these pauses, a lot of times we don't assign value to them, which really just we're camouflaging the fact that, you know, we're going to have to face, we're going to have to face the music. Yeah, if I sit on the meditation cushion, not only will I have to experience, quote, failure because my thoughts will arise, which, by the way, is not failure. It's exactly what's supposed to happen. But I don't really want to experience the feelings that are accompanied by those thoughts. Mm. And because I don't want to experience those, I'm going to be busy. Scott, let me tell you, being busy is great because it makes me feel good about myself briefly. I'm so busy. Let me tell you how great I am, how, how important I am. I'm so busy. What's the feeling I'm avoiding? Feeling unimportant. 
Interesting. Is this, I mean, is this, I want everyone to know that like, these are feelings that if you're feeling these things, and by the way, I am and have in many instances. Me that, too. <laughs> that this is, this is somewhat normal. Is this, I mean, these things, when you have your CEO boot camps, uh, which I want to make sure that people were aware of that you see amongst even some of the most quote unquote successful CEOs and entrepreneurs out there. I think the thing that still surprises me is the degree to which individuals, whether it's at campers who show up at the boot camps or individual clients, the degree to which they are in fact surprised by the universality of these expressions and these feelings. It, it is shocking and it's still, it never, it never uh, fails to happen that people, the eyes go wide open they all of a sudden realize that they are not alone and these feelings are not evidence of their unique screwed upness and once they once they're there then the peer support really kicks in because then somebody looks across the room and looks at the other person and says you too you too but you look on the outside you look fine but on the inside, you're feeling what I'm feeling. And that's the beginning of empathy. That's the beginning of focusing on other. This is really good stuff, man. And, I, and it, it kind of ties in the whole thing that if we have an expectation, if we can try to instill some expectation of universality amongst all of these things that we're going to feel, it's going to be easier to handle in the journey as an entrepreneur. That is why compassion for self and other is such a powerful tool for leadership. Jerry, this is amazing stuff, man. I mean, we've, we've, I think we can ju just kind of leave people here with a couple tools just to kind of bring this to a close. Cause I know you have to get going, but you know, step one, set the expectation that mm -hmm. this is hard and it's okay to fail. Right. Mm -hmm. Try to divorce our performance of whatever project we're working on, whatever we're trying to do from our self-worth. That's right. Right. And then lastly, try to focus on others. Yeah. And stay connected to others and cultivate empathy for yourself, compassion for yourself and for others. Jerry, this has been amazing. Thanks so much for coming on, man. If people want to learn more about you, read more about this stuff, learn about the CEO bootcamp, what are the best places for them to go? Well, my blog is themonsterinyourhead.com, monster, themonsterinyourhead.com. Uh, and then uh, the website for the boot camps is leadershipreboot.com. Awesome, man. Thanks so much, Jerry. Have a great day, dude. You too. Take care. Before we finish up with today's Mindshare, I just want to say thanks for listening to another episode of The Competitive Edge. If you enjoyed the ideas in this episode and want access to all the conversations, tactics, and Mindshares we'll be sharing in the future, the best thing you can do is subscribe to The Competitive Edge on iTunes. And while you're there, if you felt like this show has made a positive impact on your day, it'd be great if you could leave us a review on iTunes as well. Now I know we covered a lot in this episode, and there might be a few key ideas or tools that you want to remember. So we went ahead and compiled all of the notes, links, and even a full searchable transcript of this conversation for you on lifelonglearner.com. That's life-longlearner.com. I also want to give you the details on a cool contest I'm running right now at lifelonglearner.com slash fun. By entering the contest, you'll have a chance to win everything from Amazon gift cards to a free month of having your very own dedicated virtual assistant to an opportunity to come and hang out with me and my buds for a few days where we'll teach you how to create your very own passive income stream. To enter this contest and learn more about everything we're giving away, head on over to lifelonglearner.com slash fun. Okay, time for another Mindshare. How awesome was that interview with Jerry? Every single time we interact, he always leaves me with some food for thought. And after that conversation, I certainly have plenty to think about. One of the things that we talked about was this concept of vulnerability. 
And in that interview, uh, there was a couple times, I'll be honest, I felt a little vulnerable um, telling people about certain feelings that I had in my journey uh, that weren't all happy and roses and a lot of things that people, I guess, sometimes think that life is like. And you know, in my journey, my ability to be vulnerable has really changed. And a lot of my friends ask me like, dude, how can you write on your blog about how you gave up lying and you used to lie or that you didn't like the fact that you wouldn't go talk to pretty girls in the subway that you didn't know. So you went and changed that or that you used to drink and that was a real crutch and you, whatever it is, all of these things about myself that don't paint this like rosy picture of success. How do you go about and, and do that and develop that muscle? Well, the answer to that, honestly, is to treat it like the development of any muscle that you need to gradually work it and build it and exercise it until you reach a point where that is just who you are and how it is. So for a big part of my growth in being more vulnerable has been my blog, has been writing about things. And when I first, I remember when I first started my blog, I was scared to share it to my Facebook friends. Uh, because I was, you know, who is this guy to be writing things and putting his thoughts out in the world? Like, I don't want to do that. And for a long time, I didn't even share it on Twitter, uh, even though like a lot of my Facebook friends who knew me in college uh, and divorced me from like the entrepreneurship world uh, weren't on there. And, you know, eventually it was, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to share it on Twitter. Whoa, I'm alive. Uh, nothing bad happened. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to tell people that I write uh, that I'm friends with. Okay, I'm going to share it on Facebook. And you gradually push the edge of vulnerability. And before you know it, after you keep pushing the edge and keep experimenting with putting yourself out there and seeing what happens and getting that feedback loop, you become comfortable with having the conversation that I just had with Jerry or telling the world that you used to lie to make your life easier and all of these things. And I have to be honest with you, since I've become more vulnerable, I've had more awesome things happen to me. More people, like Jerry said, are are, em are empathetic and you can immediately be develop relationships with people faster that become ultimately more deep relationships just because you're presenting your true self. So if this notion of vulnerability is something that you have trouble with, um, and it's something that you want to work on and you want to grow towards and you want to do a better job of presenting your true self. It starts with a commitment to pushing your existing edge when it comes to vulnerability. So maybe tell somebody that you already know that you're comfortable with that you care about them or something that you normally wouldn't say that's exposing you to potential embarrassment or repercussion or whatever it is that you fear. And once you do that, continue to do it, condition that muscle. And then push that muscle, right? 